Namaste and good afternoon. Greetings from all of us at Apollo Hospitals. Welcome to the Freedom from Diseases series presented by Apollo Hospitals. This is Dr. Srinidhi Chidambaram and I'm very happy to see all of you. I do hope you've been staying safe and well. The series Freedom from Diseases discusses common medical conditions, latest technologies, innovations and path-breaking treatments so that you can obtain freedom from diseases that are hindering your good health. The retina is a thin layer of tissue on the inside back wall of your eye and it has millions of light sensitive cells which are called rods and cones and other nerve cells that receive and organize visual information what you see. Your retina is what sends information to your brain through your optic nerve enabling you to see. Retinal disease is a leading cause of blindness and early detection and treatment is the game changer. Pay attention to visual changes and visit an eye specialist right away if you experience symptoms such as blurry or distorted vision or if straight lines appear wavy or you see flashing lights, dark spots, etc. There are several amazing innovations in the treatment of retinal disorders and they can help you achieve freedom from retinal diseases. To discuss these in detail with us, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Abhishek Hashing. Dr. Abhishek Hashing is consultant ophthalmology and a corneal transplant surgeon at Apollo Hospitals, Navi Mumbai. He's a renowned corneal transplant surgeon practicing in the Navi Mumbai region for the past five years. He completed his residency training in ophthalmology from the CMC Velour and subsequently worked as an ophthalmologist for a year and then pursued his long-term fellowship training in cornea and anterior segment diseases of the eye at the LV Prasad Eye Institute at Hyderabad. His primary areas of interest are simple and complicated corneal transplants. He is trained extensively in the techniques of full thickness and partial thickness corneal transplants and has performed more than 500 such surgeries in a short span of five years. He also performs surgeries involving artificial cornea, implantation, and is also keenly interested in the management of complicated ocular surface diseases and treating severe chemical injuries of the eye. He's treated many such patients with modalities like amniotic membrane transplants and mucous membrane transplants. He's also an ocular trauma surgeon and has many scientific publications to his credit in various journals and a reviewer for the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, Journal of Clinical Ophthalmology, and also the official journal of the Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society, and has also conducted and participated in several seminars in ophthalmology. Welcome, Dr. Hashim. I'm so delighted that you're here with us today in our FB Live session, and I look forward to discussing uh, with you and uh, understanding uh, what uh, retinal disorders are and what are the latest treatments so that people can gain freedom from them. Thank you. Time. Thank you, Dr. Srinidhi. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me and being making me a part of this session. <clears throat> so uh, briefly, like you said, we are going to discuss about the retinal diseases today. And uh, retina, as you rightly said, is a light sensitive layer at the back of the eye. And if you had to compare it to let's say a camera, then the retina is actually the sensor of the camera or uh, the film of the camera if one is a, uh, from an older times. So uh, the retina is what gathers the light information, converts it into electrical signals after having interpreted various functions of light, namely the color, the brightness, the direction of the light. And these electrical signals are then uh, conducted through its nerve fibers and sent to the brain for further interpretation. So retina plays an extremely uh, vital uh, role for us to see and also for us to interpret what we are seeing. Uh, so that is the thing that retina is. And today we are going to briefly discuss about the various aspects of retinal disorders. So uh, yeah, Dr. Srinidhi. Yes. Uh, so, uh could you first we can begin by talking about uh, what are the common uh, retinal disorders that can occur? Yeah, so the common retinal disorders in our country are uh, usually uh, diabetic retinopathy, which happens in uh, patients who are suffering from diabetes, 
uh, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, we also have a hypertensive retinopathy, which means patients are having retinal changes secondary to uh, high blood pressure. Uh, these patients may also in, for, in future develop uh, some retinal vein occlusions, which means the uh, small blood vessels, which is supplying the blood and taking the blood away from the retina, they may get blocked uh, due to certain uh, conditions, which can lead to further vision problems. We also have uh, retinal detachment in which this layer detaches, its, detaches itself from its uh, normal location and that itself can lead to severe uh, vision loss and needs to be treated as urgently as possible. Uh, we also have a very uh, new, relatively new onset for India condition, which is known as the age-related macular degeneration, which we are seeing more and more in a lot of elderly uh, population. And then we have a lot of inflammatory and infective diseases of the retina, uh, which can be uh, caused by either injuries or some infections which have spread to the retina from the blood or it uh, due to some sort of surgery which has gone wrong. So those are the most common retinal diseases that we usually encounter in our uh, practice. Before we go on to the symptoms, uh, could we talk a little bit about diabetic retinopathy because this is something that is so common and, uh, you know, could you get, tell us a little more about it uh, in terms of uh, particularly how this happens and is there any way to prevent it because there are so many people with long-standing diabetes in our country. So to put it simply, uh, diabetic retinopathy is a result of uh, the small blood vessels of the retina, which supply blood uh, to all the tissues of the retina, getting affected. So diabetes as a condition has this tendency of affecting um, the blood vessels in all parts of our body. Similarly, it affects uh, the blood vessels in the retina. And these blood vessels then undergo certain changes. They can either balloon up, uh, they can become, uh, they can sometimes block off. Uh, leading to some areas of the retina not receiving its adequate amount of blood supply. And this in turn can lead to various uh, problems. Now, because the blood, because the retina tries to gain more and more blood, it produces certain chemicals, which are known as vascular endothelial growth factors. And this induces the production of newer blood vessels. But these new blood vessels are ill-formed. They are not properly uh, generated. They are leaky. The walls are very fragile. And so they can lead to sudden, uh, they can lead to leakage of fluid within the layers of retina, which can cause swelling of the retina with water, uh, which can cause blurring of vision. There can, the blood vessels may suddenly, suddenly rupture open, causing massive amount of bleeding inside the eye. So, and they can, and these also is associated with some fibrous bands. So these are like bands uh, which have a property of traction, which means they start pulling on the retina and that itself can detach the retina. So uh, to, to put it in a nutshell, most of the complications of diabetic retinopathy arise from the fact that it is affecting the small blood vessels of the uh, retina and, uh, then it, and then the disease progresses from there. Uh, the easiest thing to do uh, to prevent diabetic retinopathy is obviously to uh, have absolute control over the blood sugars. So need to follow whatever instructions the diabetologist has uh, given. They also need to have a healthy lifestyle in form of appropriate exercise, diet control, uh, any comorbid conditions like uh, associated high blood pressures because most of the times people who have diabetes also may have a high blood pressure or high cholesterol and blood lipid, serum lipid problem. So they also need to be controlled uh, with the equal amount of uh, zest. And that is the way where we can, uh, one, prevent the onset of diabetic retinopathy and also prevent the progression of diabetic retinopathy and avoid it from getting to a higher stage. Yeah. So uh, what are the common symptoms of uh, retinal disorders that one must be alert to? Yeah, so the symptoms of retinal disorders disorders will depend upon which part of the retina is getting affected. So grossly, the retina may be divided into the central retina and the mid-peripheral and peripheral retina. Now the diseases of the central retina, uh, they will, the person will become, uh, uh, you know, aware of their problems quite early because the central retina is the one which is most important uh, for sharp vision. 
and the blurring of vision will be noticed much earlier so blurring of vision is one of the uh, symptoms of retinal disorders like any other disorders of the eye apart from that there can also be uh, distortion in the shape objects may uh, some straight lines may appear wavy like you said in your introduction uh, objects may appear of different sizes so sometimes an object may appear smaller than it actually it is or it may appear larger than it actually is uh, and so these are the usually common symptoms of the central retinal diseases uh, diseases of the peripheral retina usually are missed or they are not uh, the patient does not become aware of them quite easily because uh, they are not aware of the peripheral vision so much so but there will be some amount of field loss uh, which means that a part of the vision that a part of their visual field is not visible to them which they become aware of much later and uh, sometimes there can also be floaters which means these small dots or spots are uh, visible in in the field of view especially when somebody is looking at a bright background uh, patient may also have flashes which means someone might feel that a flashlight has gone off in his or her eye or like a lightning strike inside the eye so all these are uh, symptoms of uh, retinal disorders sometimes incomplete images so uh, they might feel that a part of whatever they are looking at the, is missing like an object of interest uh, or if a person is looking at uh, another person then the face might be missing or the part of a shoulder or hand might be missing so that is also something uh, which patients do notice uh, in retinal disorders and uh, how are they diagnosed what are the so once they come to the eye specialist uh, what what really happens after that how how is the diagnosis done so uh, diagnosis of retinal disorders is quite simple actually uh, because we can uh, directly look at the retina during a eye examination mm -hmm. unlike many other organs where you cannot look really look at the organ like a kidney or a liver unless you do an imaging the retina is directly visible to us unless the patient has a very dense cataract <clears throat> uh, so a retinal examination is uh, a part of all routine eye checkups or all routine ophthalmic examination one doesn't have to uh, necessarily request for an additional retinal examination because by default a retinal examination is done by every ophthalmologist so and any retinal disease will be picked up by the ophthalmologist and necessary advice would be given to the patient but if a patient is just uh, complaining of blurring of vision uh, and yet and still does not know that whether this is due to a retinal cause or some other cause then a routine uh, when a patient reaches ophthalmologist the patient's vision is checked as if necessary other factors like color perception etc is checked and then a slit lamp examination is done which is sort of a, magnif a magnifying uh, telescope like thing in which we can see all the structures in a magnified manner and after that a dilating drop is uh, put into the patient's eye so that uh, the pupil which is the window to the eye it opens up widely so we can get a better uh, assessment of the whole of the retina and a retinal examination is done by this process called ret fundoscopy so some people prefer that uh, or it is also called as ophthalmoscopy so we either do it by direct ophthalmoscope or indirect ophthalmoscope depends upon the comfort of the examiner and uh, so that is done <clears throat> so like i said the, we can easily uh, look at most of the retinal diseases just by a clinical examination without going into any uh, fancy uh, imaging uh, equipment etc but sometimes we do require these imaging uh, modalities also so we have uh, certain in instruments which are uh, especially the optical coherence tomography uh, oct for short which is quite common and very very helpful nowadays to uh, you know uh, look at the layers of the retina and assess what is happening in the depths of the retina not just on the surface uh, apart from that we also have a uh, angiography procedure of the retina which basically is similar to a coronary angiography where a dye is injected into the patient's bloodstream and photographs of the retina are taken and then they are interpreted by specialists uh, we also have something known as electrophysiological tests of the retina uh, most commonly performed ones are the electroretinogram or the electro uh, oculogram and also a visual evoked potential test so this is basically uh, measures the electrical activity which is going on in the various layers of the retina 
and to put briefly and just to simplify it can be considered like a ecg of a of the retinal tissue so it is something like that so similar to an ecg two electrodes are placed on the patient's head and then a patient is shown uh, various images and bright flashlights and then the electrical activity is recorded so these are the various modalities uh, by which uh, the different types of retinal diseases can be diagnosed so doctor like you know you were saying that you know it's it's easy to diagnose because you can directly visualize the retina but there are also these additional investigations so could you tell us in what uh, on what occasions would you warrant these additional investigations uh, after the ophthalmoscopic examination yes so uh, many times uh, we can see uh, so oct and ffa or the fundus fluorescein angiography are the commonly used investigation modalities so oct is like uh, doing a histopathological examination of the retina without actually touching it or cutting it open so oct uses this uh, light or it is a coherent light and this light is passed through the layers of the retina and then it is reflected back and the machine gathers this uh, reflected light and based on the properties of this uh, reflected light and its interference patterns it can actually map the whole of the all the layers of the retina so it is as if we are able to see the microscopic level details of uh, the various layers or the sub layers of retina so this will be uh, usually uh, uh, advised if a, if a surgeon wants to have a quantification of how much edema is there or how much has the retina swollen up or uh, at what depth am i seeing a particular uh, deformity or lesion uh that because that that assessment may not be possible in in just a clinical examination and they also help us to document a person's condition and also help us to subsequently uh you know follow them up and uh, you know and compare it with their baseline records and it is an objective method because uh the machine will say the same for two different examiners Uh, but two different examiners just by clinical examination may have different differing opinions so that is it uh, usually fundus fluorescein angiography which is another uh, modality is advised uh, for conditions which deal with uh, retinal vascular disorders or in which we uh, suspect that there is some problem with the blood supply or the blood uh, of the retina so uh, this dye basically is a fluorescent dye that means when excited by a particular light it gives off fluorescence so just by assessing where the dye is flowing whether it is flowing to a particular area or not and whether uh, a dye is leaking out from some particular area we are able to assess exactly at what locations uh, these problems lie and then targeted treatment can be done for those particular areas instead of just trying to blindly treat the whole of the retina uh, without a proper uh, judgment so this uh, check of the eye or the retina uh, what would you recommend that you know like people do should they have one every year and after what age yeah so uh, people who are wearing glasses especially uh, high minus numbers uh, they usually usually get their glass power check maybe once a year Uh, so my recommendation would be to get this glass power check at an ophthalmologist not just as an at an optic optician's shop because an ophthalmologist not only checks the glass power but also does this additional retinal examination so if they are going for a glass power checkup they can do it once a year or as a requirement is if a person has been diagnosed to have a certain condition uh, let's say diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy or sometimes these retinal uh, these retina develops uh, some atrophic degenerative areas then uh, according to what the disease is the uh, subsequent follow up interval would be advised by the uh, ophthalmologist so for early stages of diabetic or hypertensive retinopathy uh, where there is not much change on the retina it might be just once a year or once in 6 months uh, if it is advised by the uh, doctor but if it has gone to moderate uh, uh, level disease or sometimes even beyond severe then a much more frequent uh, follow up might be required it could even be like uh, monthly or three monthly depending upon the severity of the condition and also the patient's other eye status like what is the status of the other eye whether it is already uh, suffering from a serious condition or not 
so uh, there is no fixed rule to what is the ideal duration of follow up for retinal uh, diseases it will depend from a case to case on a case to case basis and also what uh, condition the person is suffering from so that it would be like that um the next thing is about particular retinal diseases we spoke about diabetic uh, retinopathy uh, the other uh, condition that is common is the retinal detachment so could you tell us about this condition yes so retina if you look at the retina there are it also has various 10 sub layers so retina can be considered as one layer of the eye but there are 10 sub layers of the retina so the outermost sub layer of the retina is called the retinal pigment epithelium and then everything inside that is called a neurosensory retina which has the nerves and the pigment epithelium is what is basically uh, causing uh, supplying the nutrition and clearing away the waste of the retinal uh, cells so uh, there is a potential space between this pigment epithelium and the neurosensory retina and sometimes if there is a break or a tear in the retina either due to injury or some or any sort of a degenerative condition then fluid might enter in this potential space between the retinal uh, pigment epithelium and the neurosensory retina and the two layers sort of go, go away from each other and the and the neurosensory retina detaches so that is essentially retinal detachment uh, retinal detachment can cause severe vision loss if it is involving the central part of the retina and uh, retinal uh, detachment usually requires a early treatment i mean sooner the better if we operate on them sooner we are bound to get uh, better results uh, than waiting upon it so there are various reasons for retinal detachment it could just be an injury uh, some sort of an injury or a blunt force trauma or some sort of uh, penetrating trauma in which something has poked inside the eye that can lead to a retinal detachment and even advanced stages of uh, diabetic or hypertensive retinopathy or vein occlusions Uh, can cause these tractional bands which pull the retina off so it is like a band which is stuck to the retina and it is getting pulled off it uh, so that is called a tractional retinal detachment so uh, that is retinal detachment can lead to severe blinding conditions so this needs emergency medical attention and uh, how is it treated uh, by surgery yes so uh, treatment for uh, retinal detachment is essentially uh, surgical it's not a medical treatment at all we need to operate now depending upon the location the extent of detachment and uh, the patient's other ocular comorbid conditions uh, the surgery might be done either from an external route that is done only on the surface of the retina which is called a uh, surface of the eye which is called a scleral buccal procedure or the more more commonly performed procedure which is called a pars plana vitrectomy in which uh, a surgeon goes inside the eye and then uh, operates from inside the eye to reattach the retina uh, back to its normal location uh, the next thing is the age related macular degeneration that you were talking about uh, so could you give us uh, some details about it a little further detail? yes so age related yeah age related macular degeneration uh, the name actually says it all first of all it, it is age related which means that uh, one of, one of the causes is advanced age so now that we have uh, increased uh, you know life expectancy more and more people are uh, living beyond their 80s and sometimes even beyond their 90s so uh, with time the retinal pigment epithelium which i told you uh, was the layer which supplies the nutrition and a membrane below that which is called the brooks membrane it undergoes degenerative changes which means it just sort of starts wearing off because of its prolonged usage and um, and then because of this uh, loss of retinal pigment epithelium and the underlying brooks membrane there is a problem with the uh, nutritional supply of the retina there is a problem with the clearance of all the um, you know all the materials of i mean which need to be cleared away the uh, waste material of the retina and which start getting deposited and slowly uh, basically uh, because this is not happening there is no appropriate nutrition no appropriate waste clearance that it, it also starts affecting the retinal cells and the patient starts losing uh, vision 
the problem with this is it affects the central retina which i told you was the most important for having sharp vision uh, it affects the central retina most commonly or almost always and because of this the vision loss becomes quite uh, severe quite debilitating because the person can't see what they want to see and uh, uh, it can also become and unfortunately sometimes it becomes an irreversible uh, vision loss uh, there are uh, grossly two different types of uh, age related macular degeneration the dry variant and the wet variant uh, the dry variant usually can sometimes also progress to the wet variant and uh, in the dry variant there is no fluid collection in the layers of the retina uh, just that the cells keep dying off more and more cells keep dying off and they form this large area where there are dead cells which is known as a geographic atrophy so atrophy basically means death of cells uh, gradual death of cells and wherever that area of geographic atrophy is that those areas of the retina become uh, non functional and because it involves the central retina uh, a large large amount of vision is lost the wet variant is where abnormal blood vessels start growing in from the outer layers of the eyeball and uh, they because again like i said they are abnormal blood vessels they are leaky uh, they can leak fluid in the layers of retina and sometimes they also burst open to cause bleeding under the retina now uh, that will be uh, that is the wet variant uh, which also can be uh, treated with injections and medicines but also can cause significant vision loss which may turn out to be irreversible so now we'll take some questions which are coming in from our facebook live feed uh, what are floaters so floater is basically any uh, small opacity uh, which is in the vitreous cavity i'll talk to talk to you about what vitreous cavity is and these floaters basically are shadows of these opacities because uh, you are we see them against a bright background they appear black to us but the floater is any opacity in the vitreous so vitreous is a gel like substance which is present inside the eye behind the our natural crystalline lens so actually during our lifetime this vitreous is transparent because it has to allow for the light to pass in but sometimes some opacities do develop in the vitreous either due to simple vitreous degeneration that means the properties of the vitreous being lost over time it develops certain small areas of opacification or there can be sometimes bleeding inside the vitreous either due to injury or many of these other conditions which i told you sometimes there can be Uh, cells inflammatory cells inside the vitreous that is these white blood cells which are poured into the vitreous cavity because of some inflammation or infection so all of these may sort of clump together and form these small small clump like opacities in the vitreous and when we look the, look at them against the light uh, we see them as small uh, white black dots so uh, they appear like these floaters or sometimes people see them as like small mosquitoes or insects flying there in their vision field or sometimes even in the form of wavy lights uh, so should they be treated these floaters is that that's the next question so whenever a person is experiencing floaters definitely a detailed examination uh, by an ophthalmologist especially an examination by a ret uh, by of the retina is extremely essential if it is due to a vitreous uh, degeneration then most of the times these floaters will sort of disappear over time and they do not require any uh, treatment if it is due to uh, any bleeding in the vitreous cavity then the blood will gradually get reabsorbed within the eye on its own okay but the uh, ophthalmologist will uh, uh, you know uh, advise uh, appropriate measures so that a repeat bleeding does not happen and this bleeding can have various causes so according to the cause the treatment will be advised and any inflammatory or infective floater which might which the patient may have uh, those will definitely reduce with uh, medicines either steroids or uh, some sort of antibiotics or antifungal agents depending upon what is being suspected but the most common cause of floaters is vitreous degenerations which is not associated with any other a uh, problem inside the eye so they uh, gradually uh, disappear over time or sometimes they a person just becomes used to those floaters being there in their visual field and they do not necessarily require any treatment 
effect. What is venous occlusion and uh, CRVO and VRVO? Yeah. So vein, vein is a thin walled blood vessel anywhere in the body which carries the blood away from that organ uh, back to the heart so that the heart pumps, I mean, oxygenates it and pumps the new fresh blood. So similarly, the retina also has these veins which is carrying the blood away from the retina back towards the heart. Now, sometimes due to some conditions, especially uh, in people who have hypertensive retinopathy changes, these uh, veins, they get blocked. Uh, now, uh, so it is called a RVO or a retinal vein occlusion. Now, CRVO stands for the central retinal vein occlusion, which means the main trunk after collection of all the small venues, one, one main retinal venue, venue gets formed, which gets blocked, then it is called a central retinal vein occlusion. And therefore, because it is the primary venule of the retina, the whole of the retina will get affected. Whereas BRVO stands for branch retinal vein occlusion. So it is just one of those tributaries of that central retinal vein, which is dealing with only a part of the retina getting affected. And because of that, only a part of the retina will get affected in the disease condition and the rest of the retina will still be normal and function. So that is retinal vein occlusion and uh, I mean central retinal vein occlusion and uh, branch retinal vein occlusion that is known as CRVO and BRVO. Now what happens due to these vein occlusions is because the vein has occluded, the blood cannot flow forward. Now because the blood cannot flow forward, there is a back pressure of the blood towards the uh, uh, towards what towards the part of the vein which was lying before the blockage. Now, because of that, the veins get swollen up with blood. They, some areas it will rupture, and some areas the fluid or the, from the plasma will also leak out. So there will be edema. There will be uh, bleeding on the surface of the retina, and because now the perfusion or the blood supply is hampered the retina is also not getting its appropriate blood supply from the arterioles and it will also start getting ischemic which means it will not receive appropriate oxygenation as well as its other nutrients and those areas of retina start dying off and because it starts dying off it tries to get more and more uh, oxygenation and tries to create these abnormal blood vessels and all the subsequent problems from CRVO and VRVO develop from there. Try, the retina trying to get more oxygen. <clears throat> we often hear of laser surgery for uh, the eyes. So would you like to tell us a little bit about yes. it? Laser surgery for the eye is actually a very uh, broad term. Uh, there are different types of lasers. There are different, uh, different uh, indications of doing laser surgery. What people commonly call laser surgery uh, for cataract is actually not a laser surgery. That is a phacoemulsification surgery, which is basically an ultrasound energy, which is uh, delivered inside the eye to liquefy the cataract and then suck out the liquefied materials out of the eye. So that is one common misnomer or a common misconception that the cataract surgery is also a laser surgery. The other type of laser surgery, which is usually carried out for people who want to get rid of their glass power, is the LASIK surgery. Now in this condition, uh, it is actually a laser. It is an excimer laser. And nowadays we also have a newer variant of laser, which is called as the femtosecond laser, which is also part, um, also uh, uh, used quite often in the refractive surgery uh, uh, component. There are laser surgeries for the retina also. They are not actually surgeries, but they are laser procedures because we do not have to do them in the operation theater. They can be done in the OPD base on the OPD basis also. So the laser is basically either an argon laser, which is sort of obsolete now, but it is nowadays a frequency doubled YAG laser, which is basically a green laser, green colored laser of a certain frequency with a certain amount of energy. This is uh, shot in the patient's eye, and it and it has various functions for treating retinal diseases. For treating conditions like diabetic retinopathy, it can be used to close off this small abnormal blood vessels. It can also be used to uh, carefully uh, burn away uh, areas of retina which are not uh, required or which are sort of dying uh, so that the need for more and more oxygen is reduced. 
it is also sometimes used to uh, create small addition that is that means bonds between retina and its underlying layers so that uh, the retina doesn't you know detach off uh, so the, this laser procedure has various different usages depending upon what condition uh, we are using it for so uh, so in terms of eye as a whole there are different laser procedures not just one and but in terms of retina that is called a retinal photocoagulation with a uh, green laser uh, which is usually done with uh, for these conditions like diabetic retinopathy vein occlusions uh, any retinal tears or breaks <clears throat> so thank you dr hashik for answering all our questions very patiently and this was an extremely illuminating discussion about retinal disorders and i hope dear viewers that you've had a good overview of all retinal disorders and uh, you are well aware that uh, these kind of checks need to be done as often as your doctor suggests. Thank you so much. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the latest information and trending healthcare topics. And then if you also have any further questions on today's session, you know that you can put your comments on our Facebook page or send us a message. Till we meet again next time. Stay safe and stay well and stay healthy. See you soon. Thank you and namaste. Thank you.